Hey there, and welcome to this MVP Day session, Ransomware Tips for All. Uh, I'm Rick Vanover. I'm going to be the presenter here today, and I want to thank the MVP Day's uh, team, Kuula, for letting me present here with you today. I'm a newly returned Microsoft MVP around Azure. Um, I'm also VMware vExpert, Cisco champion, and my expertise is around the backup space, which becomes very important when it comes to ransomware. You can follow me on Twitter at Rick Vanover, otherwise uh, heckle me by the phrase Rickatron. So let's get into it. So ransomware, uh, the journey that I want to communicate with this time is a little bit educational and then transitioning into a little bit more practical tri tips on how you can not be the next headline. So I'll spend a very brief amount of time identifying what is ransomware modes of entry, how it behaves, and some of the behavior I've seen. Uh, I mentioned that I do work in the backup space, so data recovery, backup recovery. I mean, some of you know me uh, from my role uh, in that, my working role, but uh, this is a community bit, so I'm going um, just a little bit more agnostic. But I see ransomware every day in some way I, uh, around the fight and stuff, and I talk to a lot of organizations who have beat ransomware, which is great. But I pay a lot of attention to the organizations when things don't go as well as they could. Like what happened to make ransomware not, um, you know, make it the, the end result bad, right? That's actually where I spend most of my time. I'm looking for common themes around what happened that prevented the organization from proper recovery. So I'm going to share you tips on that through this journey. And I'm going to really position that as preparing for battle you and me and every one of us, our data is at risk, and I want to give you information, tips, techniques, etc. And mitigating the threat, right? I think there's an opportunity to use Azure, to use the cloud, to use even Windows technologies and, and other things. And I got some cool tricks I'm going to show you here at the end. And some demos, going to do demos, okay? So let's start really in level set. And I, I mean this in the best of ways, that um, first thing I'll say is a layered defense is the best solution, the best strategy. Because if you talk to organizations who have been through ransomware, and one, if you talk to three or four or five different ones, you're going to see three, four or five different ways out of that problem. So there's no single answer. Back to the next point, there's no single way that you can be 100% protected. Um, you know, it's not if, it's when, you know, prepare to deal with it, whatever you want to say. I want to level set and let everyone know that the threat is very significant, and you may not even know it. There's a phenomena called dwell time with ransomware where it will sit and assess, report back, and wait for the opportune time, know what your backups are, which it gets pretty nasty, some of the different threat actors out there. And I have some links later on to some reviews of, of there is such a thing as some of the different uh, ransomware threat actors out there. So you can actually explicitly see their behavior. So let's start at the basics, right? You've heard ransomware, you might know it's bad. So what is it? Well, you, you know that this threat is out there. It's a type of malware or virus, whatever you want to say it is. But it's after you and it's after your data. Ransomware is increasing every day and it's very targeted. Um, in fact, you know, there's experiences I can point you to. Just message me on Twitter. I've got some private stories I can show you. But, you know, these... Ransomware strains are very aware of where the data is. There's, you know, potential risks of inside actors and things like that. But they're becoming very targeted. It's not just, oh, my files are encrypted. You know, that, that threat does exist, but the level of sophistication is increasing with every threat that's out there. So really give some thought to how you want to address this threat because Chances are, if you don't take it seriously, the threat is going to take it more seriously than you take it. That's what I'm trying to say. But I want to highlight that, yeah, there's different modes of behavior. So there's an extortion phenomena now. And what I mean by that is it's not just simply encrypting all files left to right. There are some ransomware behaviors that will take your data out and sell it on the black market to the highest bidder. So that's an extortion technique. And then there are other ransomware behaviors that will actually do both, encrypt on-premises or wherever they get it. But then if the ransom still isn't paid, offer the extortion, right? So there's just such, such a really um, 
widespread mix of things that are out there. And then there's even some application level encryption situations. So one of the best examples are some of the things that are hitting phones. Um, I saw a smart TV uh, become bricked, uh, that type of thing. And I've even heard of a story of something going after SQL Server with native SQL encryption and selling you that key. It's actually, you know, it's an interesting way to go in. It's just one fell swoop. If it sees SQL, do its thing, boom, done. And I'll highlight that it's, it's not just a Windows threat multiple operating systems. There's a recent profile example of a threat in the Linux space even. So there have been some that have hit smart TVs and phones and, and iOS devices. You know, the, there's no platform that's immune, right? So uh, a lot of times I have these conversations with, oh, it's Windows, it's not Linux, whatever, whatever platform. Everything that uses the internet is really a candidate here. And I think that they're targeted, right? Back to that. That's where the threats are going to be the hardest to mitigate. So give some thoughts to that. So I want to highlight a number of different things. First of all, what are the modes of entry? How does it get in? How does it behave? And I have four things that I want to highlight here. One is email phishing. And when I grew up uh, doing you know, this ransomware journey, I kind of thought that phish was the most popular mode of entry. And by some accounts, it actually still is. I saw a... Um, large-scale report by a large telecom provider indicating it was the number one mode of entry. Uh, where I work, we've done some data. It indicated it was the number one mode of entry. But Coveware, I really like the Coveware reports. They indicate it's actually the number two mode of entry. Either way, this list here is, is the top four. But email phishing, for example, still is actually rather effective, and we've all seen that junk email. Like, you know, click on your delivery notice or, um, you know, the the prince wants to give you some money, those types of things. Now, the best way to mitigate that is to address it with training and, and filtering and, and uh, screening of email, the things like that, right? So um, establish things we should be doing anyways. But the one that I'm gravitating the most to nowadays is remote access done wrong. Uh, Coveware indicates that more than half of the mainstream ransomware cases that they're reporting on come in through RDP over the internet, over the internet, and that is not something that we should be doing today. So um, that's especially relevant here in 2020. If I look in March and April, a lot of organizations had to hurry with work from home. Did they have to do it right or did they have to do it right now? Well, they had to do it right now. So there's real challenges to how remote access may have been hurriedly implemented in regards to the threat of ransomware. So give some thought to that because that is a mode of entry that may be a problem. And then software updates are actually an interesting one. That uh, In the Coveware report, that's the third most popular mode of entry. But again, we're supposed to be doing updates anyways, right? We're supposed to be um, doing updates to hardware or software operating systems, applications, and stuff like that. And then the harder one here is inside actors. So I want to highlight a post from threatpost.com. We've got the short URL there. And both of these QR codes go to the Coveware report and then to this threat post link. But the thought here is that inside actors are going to be one of the harder ones to defend against. Now I'll pivot this immediately because this may be a concern. Like how do I how do I deal with that? Well, I, I really think you need a two trust model to get into that and uh, you can get into things like service providers. You can get into things like uh, security teams versus backup teams. You can get into things like that, um, escrows of backups and things like that. Um, I have some specific recommendations for that. If you ever want, just reach out to me. But the inside actor threat, I think, will um, become more popular. And in, in, in recent news, there was uh, the Tesla avoided one. I don't know if everyone saw that. And I think that was a pretty significant, almost disaster, right? So these, these types of threats and more are how they operate. But I really highlight these four because they are the biggest ways in. So if you're filtering email and you've trained your users about phish email and your IT administrators, by the way, and we've reassessed remote access, and we're doing software updates the way we should be. A lot of this stuff we should be doing anyways. At least those three, that's the bulk of the modes of entry. And then give some specific thought to your organization about inside 
actors, insider threats, and what they could do with the data. And, you know, what if I was sitting on the network and wanting to do bad things? How would that work? And some of my later tips are going to align to that. So I really encourage everyone to ask yourself a really important key question. And what I mean by that is, do you know what to do if ransomware were to come in? And what I mean by that is, you know, if you've done that training that I had advised on, did it fail? If you have detection, antivirus, things like that, anti-malware, have those not detected or prevented? What do you do if ransomware gets in? My philosophy and my kind of specific practical advice is you really need to just agree that the only practical way is to recover data if it's in, right? If detection blocks it, great, and remediates the threat on the early side, great. But if it gets in, the only option, I think, is to restore the data. Now that predicates you have actually protected it. You don't want to pay the ransom. All the experts are saying that. And you don't want to deal with conscious loss of data. So it kind of puts you in this weird, interesting middle. So that's my logic here. So I want to pivot now into some really specific tips that I think will help mitigate the risk and ensure recovery. Now, each one of these become top-level ideas that become very specific to what you have that you're working with, right? If you're in the cloud or if you're on-premises with Hyper-V and VMware or if you're only physical or if you're supporting scores of remote workers, these are some of the different scenarios that it's really hard to take the same approach for all of those different architectures. Mm -hmm. But what I've done here is implement a lot of these advices that I'm going to go through that really comes from organizations who have gone through ransomware, beat it, and then this is what they're doing different afterwards. Okay, so think about that. Those who have beat the threat, what have they changed? Chances are these are the types of things that are opportunities for others, other organizations to implement as changes. So one of the first things that I think come up are management domains. And this is that benefit of complexity versus resiliency, but the worst thing you could have, I mean, don't do this, especially in the on-premises world, hybrid world, domain administrator used for everything or even used at all. But a good ransomware strain loves domain admin live, used everywhere. It's a propagation vehicle. And if you think about how it works from the source data, again, ransomwares are aware of what you're doing for backups. I mean, it could go in and disable and delete the backups, then encrypt, then you're, you're really in some hurt, right? If you talk to organizations who have beat ransomware, one of the things that they'll put in are these logical separations of, okay, my backup infrastructure is a completely different administrative realm than the data it's backing up. Yeah, it might be hard to um, administer and manage and things like that, but it's worth it. Secondly, hardening, you know, um, explicit minimum permissions, right? Uh, I know that those lists are detailed and complicated for a lot of products, both what you're backing up from and where you're putting it to, but that becomes really, really important. And then separating that from the rest of the infrastructure that could be at risk. Because if you work backwards, organizations that get through a really bad ransomware thing situation, they consistently use language like, thank goodness I had a backup. Or, thank goodness my DR was right. Thank goodness I had backups in Azure. Back to my previous point, if you found five different people that shared their story of beating ransomware, you're going to get a number of different answers. You might get two or three that are the same. One thing I've seen a lot of that really disturbs me is I see some organizations recovering from ransomware with luck and I don't like that at all. Meaning they haven't done a lot of these things that I'm showing with you, but yet they still beat it. They still recovered and they're all high-fiving each other and happy. Yes, I'm glad we didn't have an issue, but the reality is I think there's still a lot of work to do. So management domains that are for backup infrastructures separate than the data we're protecting is a good idea. Hardening, explicit minimum required permissions, and as much separation as possible especially between the backup data, which is the mode of recovery, and the rest of that environment that you're running. 2FA every way, 
every day. Two-factor authentication is a really effective technique, and um, I know a lot of people use it for Duo, especially uh, with Duo, especially for remote desktop. And there's some native Microsoft solutions as well. But anytime you can have a two-factor authentication, and it's not just for remote desktop, by the way, um, I think you should use it in absolutely as many areas as possible. And if you're talking about an infrastructure, like your backup infrastructure, that would drive your recovery, that would be a good place for it as well. So as m many different places as you can use it, highly recommend it. And then education and awareness. This is both for end users. You could start with phish email. Awareness training also for IT pros, developers, things like that, all the way across the board. That's an investment that can be effective. Now I'll give you a tip. I think it's um, Go Fish and Know Before. Those are two products that will actually simulate your fish risk. It'll send fake fish emails to your list of recipients in your organization. And it'll give you reports on who clicked it, how many people opened it, etc. And there's your candidates for training. So give some thoughts to that. Now the next set of advice I have is remote access. And it needs to be right. And that's worth repeating. So that's one of the most um, popular modes of entry. So anything you can do to bolster the remote access would be a good idea. And don't overlook the endpoint. Back to remote access, back to the massive amounts of work from home. The endpoint, data capture, networks we're not trusting, this is really a concern. So I'm thinking about having backups on endpoints. I'm thinking about um, the remote access done well. You know, persistent VPNs is not a good idea. You know, those types of things. Give some thoughts to your environment. Um, this also, I could pivot it the hard way. And what I mean by that is this might be the ammo you need to move to Office 365 instead of everybody VPNing in for the file server. Think about that. This might be the ammo or the, the business case you need to change the application to make some serious positive changes. And then in addition to two-factor authentication, which I previously mentioned, I think it's also important to think about password policies. This is the right time to think about that, um, remote, etc. cetera. Now, if I were to have you leave this session with one thing to remember about beating ransomware, I've made up a word, ultra-resilient media. I recommend that you have one or more copies of your backup data on ultra-resilient media. What is that? Okay, yes, I made up this word. But this is a, a storage media that's inherently offline, immutable, or air-gapped. This will likely be the most effective specimen to beating ransomware. When I talk to organizations who don't beat ransomware, they consistently do not have a copy of backup data on one of these. Now, I've seen organizations that don't have data on an ultra-resilient media type and have one. That's that luck that I'm talking about. If you remember one thing, it's to have something here. What is ultra-resilient? Well, you have to look. And what I mean by that is look into what you're using, what you have, uh, what your cloud policies are, etc. I'll go through a couple example. Tape, especially worm, which means write once, read many. Tape worm media is very resilient. I know everyone's got a story about tape letting them down, but the acquisition cost, the portability, the offline element, hard to beat. Um, you could make the angle around VTLs, especially those that go deep into Azure or another cloud. That could be quasi-ultra-resilient, but separation, different authentication, different passwords, that's very important if you're going to like blur a little bit. Some cloud storages are immutable, and I've got a demo. I'm going to show Amazon. Um, Azure has it, but it's container level, so practical. It's kind of hard to do, but we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. I got a removable media option. Now, this is actually pretty interesting what I'm going to show you here in my demo. I'm actually going to show you what I'm doing at home. Um, scale it out a little bit, but pretty interesting. But any drive that's offline is pretty interesting. Now, I would also highlight that some storage snapshots can be uh, categorized as ultra resilient. Um, so if you have a SAN or a backup system, a dedicated purpose-built backup appliance, chances are there might be a snapshot mechanism in place with that device that could be used for 
a ransomware recovery. Now, some ransomwares know how to delete shadow copies. I love my Microsoft, don't get me wrong, but that's not enough. So um, a good example is like Pure Storage has this thing that you have to like call their technical support to expose it and things like that, okay? Um, something to think about. And then any other file system with an inherent immutability. Uh, some Linux snapshots can do that type of stuff, etc. Now it gets technical, you know, you can benefit when your backup product is aware of this, but give some thought, press the products you're using, the vendors you're using, find a way to have something ultra resilient. And again, when I talk to organizations that do not beat ransomware, the consistent theme is that there is not a copy of backup data on something that's ultra resilient. So now I want to pivot a little bit back to some of the education. And there's a lot of tools out there to help you. So Hitman Pro is a really good kind of um, endpoint tool. If you're not using that, you might want to check that out. And then I have two scanners, right? Uh, so scanning and, and detection, especially if you're in a maybe ransomware situation, having some tools at the ready, but more importantly, some familiarity with the tools. Um, ESET has an online scanner. I really like that one because it'll pull down the latest definitions and you can run it off of a USB. So check that out. Uh, the MSOFT emergency kit is a great scanner that you can scan offline as well. You know, because back to when and ransomware situation should happen, one of the first things you want to do, isolation. Get it off the network. Don't let it propagate the threat. But let's scan it to see what's going on. These are some tools to have. If you do have a ransomware situation where stuff is encrypted, be advised that there are tools out there to help you um, if the mitigation techniques of restoring data fail or aren't implemented. The ransomware ID tool is one that comes to mind. So ID ransomware, id-ransomware.malwarehunter.com. Upload the ransom note. It might have some decryptions that have been shared from others, for, especially for older strains. That's the one kind of ca caveat here. Uh, some of the newer stuff that's super targeted isn't going to work here just yet, but the older stuff, the common threats, the kids play encryptions, they may work here. Ransomware ID tool. And the other one is No More Ransom. This particular one actually, I believe, had started from law enforcement efforts sharing the decryption, so something to keep in mind. No more ransom.org. And then my favorite is the PC, the PC Security Channel. So Leo um, does an incredible set of videos. So you can follow Leo at Leo TPSC on um, the YouTube channel. I love it. He downloads and runs these viruses, these um, ransomwares, and shows you the behavior. He'll also show you how antivirus tools will um, respond to these threats. So having familiar with this behavior, familiarity with this behavior is very important. If you are supporting end users and you get a call and they're explaining what's going on and they're just sounding gibberish, if you've seen the way these things behave, this will really help you. I mean, those of you who are watching this video and you've ever gotten that call that, hey, something's been hit with ransomware, you know that feeling, right? It's a, it's a horrible feeling. But you don't want to find it, you don't want to take any more time to find out that that's what's going on. So knowing what these behaviors are, Leo check it out. Highly recommend Leo. And then the PCSecurityChannel.com. Okay, so how another way to get back into not having these problems is using backups in the cloud, including Azure, right? A different set of authentication, you know, move stuff around, even manually. If you don't have the wherewithal with different tools to support what you want, um, you know, move stuff into archive, cool archive, and, you know, reprioritize that storage account, things like that. You know, move stuff around on your own. You can use the cloud. I think um, it's probably the long-term future of being that long tail retention, that um, infinite storage, that low cost. I like to call it write once, read never, but never say never. You know, things like Azure, Cool Archive, can, and Amazon Glacier can help you in that regard. So let's do a demo. So let me set up the first demo that I'm going to do here. Um, this is actually what I'm doing at home. Now, I'm at the office now, but I did, I'm going to log into the home environment to do this. But I want to highlight something about the home lab. Um, see if this works. No, not that. No. Yeah. Oh, that does work. Cool. Um, my home environment 
is not like everyone else's in that I have a small business um, for a household employee, so I have payroll data. So I have data I care about, and I got my kids' pictures and um, my PowerPoints of sessions like this, right? So whatever, it's real data I care about, but I'm paranoid about ransomware. So I'm actually gonna show you what I do at home. It's kind of interesting. I'm gonna use an offline media, but I'm gonna it's kind of interesting how I'm doing it. So let's go into it. So here we're looking at my console. I am using Veeam at home, but I got a couple different jobs and let's let's sort these out here. Um, agents for Linux, I've got uh, VMware backups going on. I got some replication, that's also helpful, another way out, but it's not fully ultra resilient. Got every PC in the house being backed up with that Windows agent. But what I want to show you is that for all these different backups, I have this one called the 321 media. Now, if you've not heard of the 321 rule, it's something I talk about a lot in my day job, but have three different copies of data on two different media, one of which is off site. Really good in that it is really resilient to almost any failure scenario. It doesn't require any specific hardware. If you make one offline, you're in really good shape. So my 321 media target here is the E drive on that DThink server here. So E321, okay? So let me go look over here at this guy. Let's go browse into it. So if I'm ransomware, this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go look, DThink2, okay? Let's log in. If I got my credentials, sure, let's log in and take a look. So this is my DThink2 server, right? It's the E drive. It's, nope, nope, let's do E money. There we go. So let's go in and look at that E drive, right? So that's the UNC path of that offline drive but it is not offline. There we go, let's go into it and let's browse that. Oh, it's not working. I got an error message. The E drive, E money is not accessible. So why is that? Well, let me show you why. So now I'm actually connected to my phone, okay? So this is my Android phone and I'm gonna open the Kaza app. If you're not familiar with what Kaza is, it's a managed uh, power outlet. So I have a power, a smart plug and it's got its own little schedule and it's got uh, the ability to turn on this power source you know what it's turning on it's turning on that hard drive so let's go look at some of the configuration you know there's a lot of these you can get it with enterprise ups's but this is you know household equipment there's uh, alarms there's cloud settings there's all kinds of stuff you can do but let's look at the plug and let's see here's a timer if i wanted to turn it on for 30 minutes just to do a manual ad hoc backup i could but i have a schedule uh, that allows me to um, you run it at uh, 2340 on Tuesdays, for example. Okay, so let's turn it on. Click, I've turned it on. There it is. And in um, right in the left of me, I heard it go click at home when I did this. And so that job is pointing to that 321 media and those times align. So I give it a moment to come online and then it goes. And it's only online for a certain amount of time, a certain pre-specified number of days. And if I go over here, remember I went to eMoney and it wasn't working. So let's go into the eShare here. Ah, oh, now it is working, right? Because I've, through that power port, I've managed it to come online exactly when needed. And let's go ahead and turn it off. And I should kick off that drive instantly, right? So, you know, you think about smart plugs and stuff like that, you, you think, oh no, what could I do? But that is a way that you could have your backups be ultra resilient in the smallest of environments. And you can even scale these ideas to some of the bigger environments. So this is a dedicated backup target along with everything else that I'm doing that is offline. And then here I've also got some Linux creepers going on, different authentication, different system. Um, I've also got different places for my backups, same device, but different shares on the Synology. So completely different credentials for the Windows PCs and Linux PCs versus the virtual machines, right? Separation, separation, separation. This is my home network, right? It's not going to be the most enterprise of things that you're going to have to be ransomware, but it's a, a view into different things. So I hope that... Um, I hope that kind of gives you a good sense. And, you know, as we go into the second demo here, I want to set this one up. This one's using Azure in the cloud. Um, there's, that's a very 
attractive way to get into beating ransomware with the cloud today. And what we can do is allow the cloud to be that extra offsite and with some of the other techniques I'm going to show you, relatively resilient um, from a lot of different threats. So let's take a look here. So what I'm looking at now is a target that's going to immutable backups both in um, the cloud on uh, in Amazon and I can also put some backup data in Azure. So if I look at this environment here, I have immutable backups going to S3 and there's native immutability that a lot of backup products can use in S3 and I'll show you that here in a second. But I also can put backups in Azure. So you might want to get into things like um, putting your backups into the um, different storage accounts and blob containers, etc. But with AWS, a lot of products have implemented object lock, which will make backups immutable. So if I look here, you can have this immutability aspect right here. So in this example, anything I put in there, I'm going to hold on to it for 14 days to make it immutable, meaning I can't delete it through the backup app. This, this is actually kind of real, really effective for things like accidental deletion, like if I accidentally deleted all the backups, or I, I started learning PowerShell, and I didn't do such a good job, and it deletes everything. Same thing with you know Azure. I can put backups in Azure as well. And um, Azure immutability is a little different than Amazon's right now, but um, I think you'll, you can watch this over time. Um, change a little bit. So I'm going to log into my Azure account here. This is Azure Storage Explorer. I've done a lot of blogs about this on checkyourlogs.net, by the way. Shout out to the Koolas. Uh, so let's take a look here. If you have some of your different storage accounts, you know, you can get into managing it differently, putting them in different storage accounts in different regions that, and have a good nomenclature of what they are. This I have a system for these newer ones that are consistent. That makes sense to me. Um, and then think about using some of the new um, other storages. So um, Azure has Cool Archive, which is a really good long-term storage technique. And if you look here, you can always look and have that archive accessed here. It's ultra low cost. So even if you get into manually putting backups or files or data into Azure Cool Archive, you can go and enjoy that long-term storage. So it's really important to know the difference across the different Azure access tiers. So one thing, and you can be just like me and Google Azure Archive Storage and take a look here. So on Azure, let's take a look at the access tiers. Yeah, this document. Um, Archive is pretty cool because it's intended, huh, pretty cool, sorry. There's hot cool in Archive, but Azure Archive Storage is rather awesome in that it's optimized for data that's rarely accessed and stored for at least 180 days. Store, you're committed to storing it for 180 days. Write once, read never, but never say never. So give some thought to maybe even you know some Azure scripting and PowerShelling to get around it. Um, if you don't have like a solution that natively supports this yet, you know, give some thought to it. Hopefully these demos makes uh, makes your you know opens your eyes a little bit about some of the opportunities. So. Um, again, I'm Rick Vanover. I hope you've enjoyed this session and a big thank you to the MVP Days crew for allowing me to uh, be with you here today. Um, you can email me at work with some specifics if you want or heckle me on Twitter. That's a good place as well. But uh, the war on ransomware is real. I've done a lot of work that gets a little bit more specific to my day-to-day -day job. Um, but, you know, always reach out to me for any advice that you might have. But one or more copies of data on something that's ultra resilient is the one thing I want you to remember. And then what do you have to work with that will work with for you? Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of MVP days.